Thank you very much and thank you everyone um, for coming today and despite the weather and despite COVID and everything that's stopping us uh, uh, getting anywhere at the moment. Um, so <clears throat> I know uh, quite a few faces around the room uh, but for those who I don't um, know well, my name's um, George Crowther. I'm one of the uh, old age liaison uh, psychiatry consultants uh, within the trust here. Uh, and also, as Sarah mentioned, have a, an academic role within the trust. And I'm going to be talking to you today briefly before your lunch, and I'll try and keep it brief because I know you're all probably getting hungry, um, about a study that we're undertaking here in Leeds, um, which is about understanding and improving outcomes for people with Parkinson's disease in the general hospitals, so over at Leeds Teaching Hospitals Trust, um, so St James's and LGI. And it's a project that we're collaborating with that trust um, with, and um, Max, who, who chaired the first uh, meeting this morning, myself, a consultant neurologist uh, called Jeremy Cosgrove, um, set up and have been organising this uh, project, along with the help of Amelia and uh, Pamela from the um, R&D department. And I'm going to be focusing on this talk to tell you a bit about the, a bit about the, the study itself, but we're fairly early on and, and the, the data we've got so far um, is sort of not, not hugely ready for publication, but I, I will tell you bits about it, but more to focus on what opportunities we have locally for getting hold of large amounts of data um, and for collaborating with our partners locally. Uh, and to use that hopefully as an example of what we can achieve uh, um, uh, in Leeds. So, Parkinson's disease, maybe not something you'd expect us to be talking about at a mental health uh, uh, sort of research forum, uh, but something that can be hugely re uh, relevant to us all. Um, incredibly common, uh, sort of a lifetime risk of 2.7%, and in the UK around 66,000 people with a diagnosis of Parkinson's. And the things that you'll probably associate with Parkinson's disease will be the physical symptoms that we uh, more commonly talk about. So bradykinesia, so slowness of movement, uh, a tremor and stiffness. But actually, um, people with Parkinson's disease have a, a raft of psychiatric and uh, psychological symptoms that go along with that as well. So they're very prone to apathy, anxiety, depression, sleep disorders, delusions, hallucinations, and also, people with Parkinson's, particularly after having that uh, Parkinson's disease uh, for a number of years, um, are, are prone to developing Parkinson's disease dementia as well. And people with Parkinson's also have a higher uh, uh, propensity for being admitted to general hospitals. This is uh, St. James's, looking actually quite nice. It normally doesn't look very nice, but I tried to find the nicest picture I could of it. Um, usually it's... Um, uh, surrounded by police and ambulances. Um, anyway, that looks quite nice. But it, it isn't usually a particularly nice place to be. Um, well, it, it maybe it's a nice place to be for anybody, but it isn't particularly a nice place to be if you have Parkinson's disease. Because what's it like to be in hospital with Parkinson's disease? Well, your outcomes, I'm afraid, aren't generally as good as people who are the same age with the same conditions as you with Parkinson's disease. So you're two times as likely to stay in hospital uh, for longer. You're two and a half more times likely to die while you're in hospital. You're two times more likely to have a fall while you're there. You're five times more likely to develop delirium. And you're three times more likely to have an adverse drug event. So really that means somebody messing up your prescription um, because people with Parkinson's disease are generally on quite complicated prescriptions um, uh, by, the, uh, by the clever neurologists. Um, and so, actually, they're a group that we need to focus on while they're in hospital um, because they're complicated and they don't generally do very well. Now, we know that, but we don't really know why they don't do very well. Um, and, there, and that, in, in, in essence, sort of brings up the, kind of the question here of why aren't they doing very well and what can we do about it? Well, first of all, we set out looking at that question and go, well, where do all these people go when they come into hospital, because actually one thing we know about them is most people with Parkinson's disease when they come into hospital aren't looked after by the doctors that deal with Parkinson's disease. Actually the most common reasons for coming into hospital when you've got Parkinson's disease are a urinary tract infection, a pneumonia, or you've fallen over. And most people don't come in because of their Parkinson's, and that means that they're looked after by teams who are, who are very good, but not perhaps used to looking after people with Parkinson's disease, so those might be general medics geriatricians, orthopaedic surgeons, 
And yes, they've got access to liaison services from, uh, from uh, uh, the, the neurology teams and they've got access to liaison service from the mental health teams, both of which are required to help these, uh, these people with co the complex neuropsychiatric condition. But actually, uh, you know, what, you know, what they're perhaps sort of lacking is, is sort of that all-round wraparound care. So we wanted to identify the parts of their hospital stay that might predict that poor outcome and try and better understand that. So we set up a project uh, to try and do that. So first of all, what we wanted to do was describe in our population of people with Parkinson's disease admitted to our local hospitals, whether they were also having problems with staying in hospital longer dying, uh, sort of uh, having a greater chance of dying, um, falling over, having adverse incidents um, and staying in hospital for longer. But what we wanted to do differently was try and compare. So we wanted to try and get data on, well, when they've come into hospital, where have they ended up in the hospital, who have they been under, uh, and what part of their admission predicts their outcome. Is there anything that we can say, well, actually, if you know, everyone who goes to this, this area or everyone who's subject to this sort of treatment or everyone who's come in with this particular disease that isn't their Parkinson's, maybe they, they get worse outcomes. So we wanted to get that data, compare it, uh, and then have a look um, sort of where, I guess, our weak spots are, where we can learn, or where the strong spots are, where we can learn from. So that comes on to the third objective, which is to try and learn from that. And this is a project, this is kind of the next project along, really. This is why it's asterisked. But that will be a qualitative study, so sort of then trying to explore those areas of, uh, of, of sort of strength and explore those areas of potential weakness, um, interviewing health, the healthcare professionals who work there. What's tricky about working with those patients? So what do we do next? Well, next we went off looking for money to try and do that. So um, uh, actually, we, uh, this uh, study was uh, funded by Furblank, who are a, a neurological research uh, charity. And... Um, uh, they very kindly uh, sort of funded the, uh, the quantitative part, the data part of our study. So we then went off to the, the computer guys at LTHT uh, and had a chat with them. And they um, uh, went and got us our data and were absolutely fantastic to work with. So this is the research data department at LTHT. So what did they give us? So they gave us two years worth of data, two years of every person uh, anonymized uh, uh, sort of, uh, and individual and aggregated data um, admitted to our local hospitals uh, with Parkinson's disease and that came out in a very large spreadsheet with 713 patients on but obviously much more admission because some people are admitted more than once um, and so that's uh, around sort of 1,150 well it isn't around, it is 1,157 admissions um, and so what do we ask for within that? Well, what we got from them, we got an idea of time. So we knew, uh, first of all, we know how, roughly how old everybody is. They're in age brackets, we don't know exactly. And we know how long they've had their Parkinson's diagnosis for. That's important because the longer they've had their diagnosis, because it's a progressive illness, uh, the more symptoms we might expect them to have. Um, then we asked, we, we looked at the hospital data. So we've, look, we've got data on how long they've been in hospital, what their length of stay was like. And... Uh, and also what they came into hospital with and what they, they left hospital as diagnosis with. They're often different things. Someone might walk in the door and be told that, you know, that they've come in with a fall, but actually they might leave hospital with a diagnosis of a heart condition because that's what caused them to fall. So we've got both of those data points. We've got, we know what medications people are on, particularly um, in relation to their, um, their Parkinson's drugs, so their dopaminergic drugs. We've got a, uh, we, we know how many dopaminergic agents people were taking. And also, critically as well, we know how many antipsychotics and acetylcholinesterase people were taking. Um, so that gives us an idea of um, uh, you know, what, um, what medications we, we're, we're giving to people. And also, we know how many adverse drug incidents there were while they were in hospital. So that means we can um, have a look. You know, when I said earlier that there's the greatest chance of adverse drug incidents, well, we can see if that's the case and where, you know, what are the better and worst performing parts of the hospital. We know how many people fell over. We know how many people were aggress aggressive or, or, or um, uh, sort of violent on the wards. Um, not many, I have to say. Um, and we know how many people died. Um, and all that data allows us to build that big picture of what's going on or what we're currently building at the moment. I can give you a brief snapshot of what we know so far. Um, 
And what we know so far is that of our group, so of those 1,157 admissions, 9.3% of them died while they were in hospital, which is in keeping with the sort of uh, the data that I presented at the beginning, but higher than you might expect for their age. And actually, 18% of them died either in hospital or within the 30 days of their admission, so within that sort of treatment period, as it were, so quite high. 18% of them went home but never really maintained themselves being at home. So went home, didn't, uh, the, the, if you like, we kind of might call it a failed discharge, but really what that means is they went home and then bounced quickly back into hospital within 30 days and were readmitted. And 22% went through a major transition in care, um, and that is that they weren't discharged to the place they came in from. So perhaps uh, they came in from home and were discharged to a care home or came, home, came in from a, a residential home and were discharged to a nursing home. So 22% of those people, so, yeah, a good chunk, actually had what was a major life-changing uh, uh, social event as well. Um, so just as a sort of, and this I'm afraid is, is all, all the snapshot we've got at the moment, but just as a brief snapshot, you can see that the outcomes and the changes for those people um, uh, are, are, are huge. Um, and so understanding why those outcomes happen and if we can improve those outcomes happen can have a, 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 could potentially have a, a massive benefit for them. So what do we do next? Well, next we're going mining and we're really looking hard into that data because we've got a vast amount. As, you know, I said that spreadsheet was big. It's huge. And we've got so much data in there and we want to try and unpick it. So now um, we're really trying to understand what's in there um, and how we can tell a story from that um, that means that we can then cohesively take that forward. And then we're going looking for more money um, because that, you remember I said there was that learn aspect um, of this project, the qualitative aspect, because actually it's only so good knowing that there's a problem, but actually what you want to know is why there's a problem. Uh, I think that's the really important part from this is, you know, is, is going to be of saying why there's a problem because only then can we start to say, well, what do we do next? How do we fix it? Um, or how do we go about starting to fix it? And what can we learn from a, a local perspective? What can we learn from, uh, from a Leeds perspective? Well, I think um, looking around this room today, um, there's people come far and wide, but there's a huge number of people from, from Leeds, and I think we've got to look at sort of what are our local resources here. This data isn't particularly hard to come by, uh, and we've got, uh, we've got friends and neighbours with big hospitals and we ourselves have uh, uh, access to this sort of data that we can use, look at and answer some really important questions. Um, and that we've got incredibly um, sort of helpful departments um, we can work with. So I think it's, there's a lesson here about the ease and importance of getting big data and working with our friends and neighbours. Um, Leeds is a big city but it's quite compact uh, and just working together is hugely important. It also, I think, um, for those of you who are here today and are looking at getting involved in, in research or looking for a project that you might want to sort of pick up on, well, we've got a ton of data here and we're not going to be able to answer all those questions ourselves. So if there's something you're particularly interested in this, come and speak to me uh, and we can look at ways that you might want to um, think of ways that you might want to, um, to look at that data. And we've also, uh, on the horizon, got the potential to use our own sort of big data um, with uh, the potential uh, arrival of uh, Acruvia who... Um, will be um, working with the trust and working with the R&D department to look at using uh, care directors, so our own electronic mental um, health record, um, uh, to, uh, uh, to be able to pull out large amounts of data about our population so we can start to ask those questions about our mental health uh, uh, service users as well. Um, so I think you know, those for me are the big lessons on... You know, we have a huge amount of resource here. We have a huge amount of opportunity, both with our neighbours, both with ourselves, and, and we need to, to grasp onto that. So I'm going to leave that there for now and let you all get on with your lunch. But I'm very happy to ask questions uh, sort of straight away, or you can come and grab me over lunch if you like, um, whichever works best.